So again, that's John chapter 14, verses 5 through 10. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word today. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, uh, this is a season of hope, and uh, hope is a very important thing. Hope is something that I know in my life that when I don't have hope, I have despair. I have depression. I have uh, an unsettledness about me. Hope is something that we all need. Um, it, it, one of my favorite movies uh, is a movie that I saw for the first time when I visited Ann Arbor, actually, back in 1995 for colleges. I went to see... Um, it, it's now called Rave, but it used to be called Showcase Cinemas. I went to see um, Shawshank Redemption there. And there's a line from that movie that says, hope is a dangerous thing. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope is something very important for all of us. And, um, you know, over the, the, well, last week and then this week and next week, we're doing kind of a, a sermon miniseries that we're riffing off some themes in Star Wars. <laughs> so last week was called Far, Far Away, and uh, today it's called A New Hope. And that line, uh, A New Hope, is not just uh, the name of Jason's old church in Lansing, uh, <laughs> but it's also uh, the title, the subtitle of the first Star Wars movie. And so in 1977, Star Wars came out, and it was not called A New Hope, it was just called Star Wars. But four years later, because they kept re-releasing Star Wars almost every year, because it was such a like, mind-blowing movie at the time, and it was doing so well that they're like, hey, you know what? People want to see it again. So they just kept re-releasing it. And so in 1981, four years later, uh, George Lucas uh, put a little subtitle on it. He called it Episode Four: A New Hope. And people were like really mystified by that. They're like, why is it all of a sudden Episode Four? And then he told them, it's because this was always meant to be the fourth movie, right? And then they had these horrible prequels that were really bad and they weren't really necessary. But, you know, why is it called a new hope? Because the implication was there was an old hope. And so the story of the prequels, we're not going to get too much into this. For those who don't like Star Wars, don't worry, this won't dominate the sermon. But the old hope was Anakin Skywalker, right? Luke Skywalker's father who ends up being, spoiler alert, you can close your ears for the next 10 seconds if you really don't know the story of Star Wars and don't want to know it. <laughs> but uh, Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader, right? And he was supposed to be this chosen one, right? He was supposed to bring balance to the Force. And in, in the, the third Star Wars, um, when Lu uh, Anakin, sorry, betrays the Jedi and his mentor, you know, sees that Anakin has kind of fallen off the path of the light side and, and been drawn to the dark. You know, there, there's this scene where he's like crying in tears. He's like, you were supposed to be the chosen one, right? But really, the one who was supposed to bring uh, balance to the force is Darth Vader's son, Luke Skywalker, right? And so that is what the title of the movie is about, is the hope that the whole galaxy has comes through the sun. You're like, oh, Pastor Steve, I see what you're doing here, right? <laughs> Hope comes through the sun, right? And so in a similar way, that is where our hope comes from. It comes through Christ. And so we see in this passage that we just read uh, that Jesus is telling uh, the disciples in their moment of greatest despair, in their moment where Jesus has just told them, hey, you know what? The time has come. I'm going to be leaving you guys. I'm going to be going back to the Father, right? 
And then he tells them, well, you know what? You're going to get to be with the Father too. And so he's trying to explain what that means. And the disciples, their state, mental state, their emotional state in this passage is, is really heightened. They're, they're not okay with this. They're really scared. They're really afraid. Um, they're really sad and depressed. And this is all going to come out. And so friends, when we need hope the most is in those moments when you're feeling scared, when you're feeling confused, when you're feeling depressed. Maybe some of you have been feeling that. And so Jesus' words hopefully will be a comfort to you as well. So let's take a look his, at his words here. So first of all, we see Thomas saying, after Jesus has just said, I'm going to be going away, but you're going to see the, you, you're, I'm going to show you the way too, to where I'm going. And so Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? It's a very reasonable uh, question, right? And it seems like Jesus is talking about like the afterlife, right? I'm going to go be with the Father. And so, you know, Thomas is like, okay, well, where is that? How can we even know the way there if we don't even know where you're going? So Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So friends, this is the question, or this is the kind of thinking that we usually have uh, for many of us today as modern Christians. We wonder, how can I get to heaven? How can I be with the Father, right? And that's what Thomas wants to know. But Jesus' answer doesn't seem to be answering that question. He's talking about him being the way, the truth, and the life in general, right? If you really know me, you will know my Father from now on. You do, you do know him and have seen him because you have seen me. Because you know me, you know God. And so Philip says something that probably a lot of us have wondered at some time or another. Either you've thought this, you've said this. Friends, I know that I uh, have thought this thought before. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. So what Philip is saying is, Jesus, you're not enough, right? But if you show us God, you know, like, like if somehow you're able to just part the heavens and we could get a glimpse at the face of God, right? Maybe God could make a cameo. God could step down from heaven and he could show us himself. If we could see him, if we could hear him, if we could have this spiritual experience, then that will be enough. We'll be satisfied. We won't be so scared. We won't be so confused. We won't be so depressed. We won't feel so alone if you could just show us the Father. So Jesus, can you make this happen? That will be enough. And you see Jesus' response is he's kind of a little bit bummed by this. He, he, he's kind of heartbroken a little bit. And, and, and friends, you can kind of see this um, or, or hear this. At least this is the way that I read this passage. Jesus answers I don't think there's anger here. I think there's sadness. It says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time? Like, Philip, yo, I've been with you guys for over three years. You still don't know? You don't know me? I'm not enough for you? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And so, friends, I think that you know, we might give Philip a hard time here and be like, Philip, what's wrong with you? So unspiritual, man. How could you diss Jesus like that? But I wonder if we are like Philip. I wonder if I am like Philip. That I think that, you know what? Jesus is great and all. I've heard about Jesus. I've read about Jesus. But Jesus isn't quite enough for me. I need something else. I need some kind of special spiritual experience. Maybe I need to go to a retreat or a revival or some special kind of prayer uh, needs to be going down for me to experience God in a new way. Maybe I need some kind of new program or a new book or a new philosophy, right? But maybe I, I need a new church. Maybe my church isn't doing it for me. There's something new that I need to change my situation. Maybe it is my situation. Maybe the problem is that I'm in Michigan and Michigan is just not a very spiritual place because it's always drab and the weather's really bad. You know what's worth spiritual? Hawaii. If I went to Hawaii, if I lived in Hawaii, I would be so much more spiritual because I would see the beach and I would see, you know, the beautiful sun and the sand and the warm weather, 
right? I need a change of scenery. Then, then that will be enough. I need something to change in my life. You know what? It's because my life is too stressful. It's because my job is too stressful. It's because my family is too stressful. You know what? It's because I'm lonely, right? It's because I don't have someone to share my life with. Or the person that I have, I don't really, they need to change. I need some kind of new hope. Maybe it's because I, I'm not exercising enough. I don't like how my body looks. I need to change something. I need to change it up. Friends, where does your hope lie? What do you think will change your life for the better? This is a, a time where it's all about hope, right? We just had Christmas and Silent Night, Holy Night, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men. You know, we're feeling good after Christmas, and then we start to think, oh, just in a few days, it's going to be a new year. We're going to turn the corner on 2015, and it's going to be 2016. A fresh start, a blank slate, a brand new year. And so, friends, very popular are New Year's resolutions. We can change. We can change everything, right? And so it's going to be new. I'm going to make a resolution, right? I'm going to make a resolution, and it's going to be bound by blood. I'm going to do this thing, and it's going to get better. What's going to get better? Everything's going to get better. I have hope. Friends, where does our hope usually lie? Let's just take the example of a New Year's resolution, right? There are two things that we usually put our hope in, in a New Year's resolution. But I also think that this is where most of us put our hope at most times. Two things. It's situation, right, circumstance, some external thing that needs to be changed, and our willpower, right? Those two things is where most of us put our hope, right? So I need to change my situation. My situation is put on too much holiday weight, right? Had too much ham, had too many Christmas cookies, right? You know, holidays is just, oh, there's so many good things to eat, right? And I, I need to get on that treadmill, right? I need a new workout regimen, right? The reason why I'm dragging, the reason why I'm feeling so depressed is because I'm physically not feeling good. I need to change this circumstance, right? And so how am I going to do that? I'm going to do that through willpower, right? And so I have decided that I'm going to change this thing about myself and that will make it all better, right? Friends, this is usually where we place our hope. And the question that we need to ask ourselves, friends, that is a very, very important question to ask is how is that working out for you? Because we know, right, that there is this sort of false hope that the new year brings. That every year people think, I can change this thing. I can be better. My life can get better, right? And what most of us want is we want happiness. We want success. We want something uh, productive to happen in our lives. And we place this hope in um, our circumstances, place this hope in our jobs, place this hope in how we feel, right? And friends, what is it that we are really looking for? What is it that is really going to give us hope? For the Christian, it has always been about one thing. It has never been about the circumstances. Because you see Christians all the time, and Jesus is very clear on this. Scripture is very clear on this. Sometimes being a Christian actually makes your circumstances worse. Um, I was talking to a couple of brothers earlier, and I, I forget how we got on this topic, but we were talking about Revelation and, you know, how, like, the language in Revelation is so weird. And I was trying to explain that the reason why the, the, the language in Revelation is so weird is because they were writing in symbols and codes. Because at the time, to be a Christian, to have Christian literature was a death sentence. And not just a death sentence, but you could be killed in a completely ghastly, terrifying way, right? The Emperor Nero was insane, and he wanted to rebuild Rome. And so he torched large portions of the city. And when the Roman citizens were like, hey, who started these fires? Nero was like, ah, it was the Christians, right? Those weird people who are cannibals, right? They eat the flesh of their leader, right? Like communion, right? They, they commit incest, right? Because even husbands and wives, they call each other brothers and sisters in Christ, right? There's some weird incest going on. So it must be those weird Christians, right? And so there became a witch hunt where they started to hunt down Christians and they would burn them at the stake. 
right? They would, he used uh, Christians as like, you know, uh, living torches to light his garden, right? Just strapped a Christian to a, a pole and lit them on fire. They would put Christians in uh, sheepskin and, and lambskin and they would send them out into the arena and they would release wild dogs. This is what they did to Christians, right? And friends, this happened while some of the New Testament was being written. And Christians always have been very clear about this. They're like, we know that being a Christian can sometimes mean that we get persecuted. It's not about your outer circumstances. That's not our hope. Our hope comes from Christ. And that has always been the, the hope of the Christian, the hope of the Christ follower. And this is what Jesus relates to us here as well. He says, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me. We're going to get more into this idea next week. But Jesus is going to go on in chapter 14 to talk about how he is in union with the Father. The Father is living in him. And then he says, now you are going to be in me and I'm going to be in you. Then you are going to be in the Father. This is how you get to know God, by knowing me, by my life living in you, right? Because if you see it, what he's saying is that the words I'm speaking to you, they're not just from me. I'm not just making this stuff up. This is coming from the Father who is living in me. And so I want to come live in you. This is your hope. Not that everything around you changes, but that what is on the inside changes when Christ lives in us. The disciples, they didn't quite get this. And so friends, don't, be too, don't beat yourself up too much if you're like this, if you're like me. Because friends, I'm like this. I keep thinking, man, if just this one thing changed in my life, if I could just change this one thing, if I could have a little bit more money, if I could lose a little bit more weight, if I could just, you know, shake this problem of depression, this one little circumstance in my life, if I could change that, everything would be better. I'd be okay. And friends, that is never the Christian message, right? And Jesus is very clear about this. He's saying, you want something to be changed, even if it seems like a spiritual thing. Philip says, Jesus, just show us the Father. Just show us this one thing. And then we're going to be set. And Jesus says, no, that's not, you, you've already seen the Father. You've seen me. This is what you get. And this is what you need. You need me living in you. Friends, this is our hope. I said this last week, that what I have been chasing over the last, I don't know how many years, I have been chasing uh, this sense of spirituality that I always thought that I needed to achieve somehow, right? I need more discipline. I need more spiritual depth. But what I really need and what I was looking for all along is Jesus. That's what I need, Jesus. It's so simple. The answer is right in front of you. The answer is not sexy, but the answer is always relevant. And it is what we need. It is what our souls crave. Friends, think about this idea that Jesus is God embodied in human form, just a power pack of God that was sent to be with us. He is God with us. God trying to demonstrate for us how to live this life with God. It's exactly what Jesus did. And Jesus came to share his life, to empty his life, to die for us, to shed his blood on that cross so that we could also share in the life of God. If that is true, friends, if that is true, not just a story that we make up, but that is the absolute truth, then what else could there be that would be greater than that? What program, what book, what circumstance in your life would make your life better than the actual life of Christ that can live in you? Friends, so then the question remains, okay, Pastor Steve, I've heard messages like this before. You know, it makes sense on paper. It sounds good. All you need is Jesus. You can put that on a bumper sticker, but that's not going to change my circumstance. That's not going to change how I feel, right? 
And friends, the, the thing is that what I've learned so much is that we in this culture, we in this society, we have completely been brainwashed and programmed. We are running on an automatic program, an operating system that is designed to not be with God. It's designed to make you God, right? So much of our lives are about control. Why are we so obsessed with our circumstances? We are so obsessed with our circumstances because we think that if our circumstances could be handled, if we could understand it, if we could be in control of it, then I will have peace. Then I will be good. That is about me being God. That is what our world is all about. So friends, for us to then welcome Christ in, it is a revolution. He is overthrowing your authority. And so just to say, okay, I need Jesus, but what does that mean? He needs to be Lord. He needs to come in and rule and reign in your hearts. We're going to be talking a lot more about this. Uh, our next sermon series is going to be uh, called The Kingdom Life. And that's what, what we're talking about here. We need a new kind of kingdom. We need to believe in this and to live for this and to want this in our lives and to start living our lives in different ways to have this reality. And so a lot of what this takes, friends, um, is for us to um, think upon Christ, to think about the greatness of Christ and to make room for him in your life. And so we've been talking about this for a while, but I want to try to convince you again, friends, that in this holiday season, in this time where we're talking about Christ so much, but so little of our time is actually spent with Christ. Isn't that true, Christmas? Right? You hear all these songs about Jesus, but why is it that Christmas is more stressful than any other time, right? It's because we're talking about Jesus, but we're not spending time with Jesus. That is what will bring you real peace. That is what will bring you real change in your life. We need to be still. We need to hear that still small voice. We need to let him challenge some of that operating system that's just running in the background all the time. That's telling you you need to go, go, go. You need to achieve, achieve, achieve. Telling you you need to be someone, do something. Telling you that you have to be a certain way. And we need to start listening to the voice of Christ who's telling you, you know what? Just be my child. Just let me love you. I did everything. I did everything on the cross. You just need to receive this. And so you need to realize that I am God. I want to be your God. I want to be your Lord. I want to reign in your heart. This is your hope. This is your hope for change. You're not alone in this. You're never alone. That's one of the things that is so hard about this world, even for the Christian who isn't convinced of that reality, that Christ is always with you. He always wants to be with you. Isn't that the most depressing thing during the holidays to be alone, right, where you have no one around you? Right? It's one of the most depressing things in life. And it's why so much of our hope surrounds uh, relationships, right? A spouse and then a family, right? kids, all that. So much of hope is about being in relationship. Friends, that is by design. God designed you that way, right? But the ultimate relationship he designed you for is to be with him. I am one with the Father. He is living in me, and I want to share that life with you so you can be one with us. So in that situation then, there is no circumstance, no loneliness, no problems in this world that can take you away from what is the ultimate hope for us, is that connection with God, that connection with Jesus. So friends, I, I want to encourage you. Um, in fact, we're, we're going to do this during this time. Uh, I, I want to say that when we do this at church, it's harder because you're with other people, right? I, I think it, it, it's easier in some ways because we're thinking about God, we're, we're in this place, that we set aside this time to be with God. We've sanctified this time. And so being with God sometimes is easier in church, but sometimes it's harder because you're around other people. So I want to do something that I want to encourage you to emulate when you get home. At some point, some of you are on break, some of you aren't, some of you got to go back to, to work. 
But friends, find the time. This is the most important thing you can do, is to find time to be with Jesus, to let him be the Lord in your life, to let him be the Prince of Peace. Let him be the God who is with you. Let him be the one who can show you a new way of being, a new way of life, a new hope for all time. So friends, um, you know, we have this kind of intimate space, this kind of intimate time. You know, but before we ask Jason to come up uh, to lead us in a closing praise, I, I find that silence can be so disconcerting because it really disrupts uh, the kind of rhythm of life that we've developed, this sort of operating system that we're all under where we're so busy, we're so hurried. It's all about producing. It's all about being something significant, doing something significant. Right? Having something to show at the end of the day, like, oh, I was so productive today. Friends, being silent, being still before God, it disrupts that flow. Can we just take a moment just while we're here you know, to just breathe in the air? We are no longer slaves to fear, as we say. We are children of God. We can just be with God. So friends, can we just take a moment and just maybe take some deep breaths? And I want you to think this thought. God is here with me right now. Jesus is here. Can you welcome him in? Can you maybe speak those words just so simply? It it, it doesn't have to be fancy, but hopefully we can say that with some sincerity and humility. We can carve out this space in our lives. We can still ourselves sacrifice this time and this moment to say, Jesus, I want you to come and step in. You're not going to feel much, maybe. I I don't know, friends. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But if you're anything like me, you probably won't feel much. That's okay. You're carving out that space. You're making room for a new reality, for a new hope. We're going to need to practice. We're going to need to discipline ourselves. But if you do this every day, you welcome him in. You will have that hope. You will have that light. You will come to enjoy the greatest thing, if you can call it that, that God could ever give you, his own son. Lord, I confess that I'm not great with silence and stillness. There's always this part of me that feels like I need to be doing something. But Lord, the most important thing that I can be doing is sitting before you with open arms, with open hands, with an open heart and mind to receive you again. Lord, you are always here, but I need to have your presence manifest in my life to know your reality, to know the hope that can only come when Christ is King, when Christ is Lord. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that we can carve out that time, that we can come to know you and how wonderful you are, that we can come to know that when when we have you living in us, God, that is the ultimate solution. That is the ultimate goal. That is the ultimate joy and hope that we have for life. So thank you, God, for offering that to us freely. And we're so grateful, God, to spend this life with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.